Fantastic. So we are recording this keynote and there'll be a Q&A discussion afterwards. So um, if you have any questions as we're going along through the presentation um, that are in a more sensitive nature, please email me or put it in the chat privately and we can respond after the event privately. Um, if you've got any questions, we do want all your questions as we go along today. If you can put those in the chat as we go along, um, we will be doing the Q&A part after the main um, talk today. And I will moderate those with uh, Dr. Costas and yeah. George is joining me as moderator today. Um, we'll be also putting in a link to our feedback form and we would like your suggestions on how we can approve improve our uh, webinars um, and any testimonials that we can use as well would be fantastic. This seminar is part of the certification that we're offering for attending all six seminars. So if you want the certification and you attend all six, please make sure that your name on the screen and in your registration is matching. Otherwise, please send me an email. I have been receiving a few emails. So thank you very much from that. And I'll coordinate them and match them up afterwards. But we just need to know who you are on your ICF uh, registration, as well as our Zoom registrations, so that we can ensure that you have attended all of them. And we can then send the certificate according to your ICF member name. So um, please, make sure you're, you know, all of those are up to date and in sync. Um, towards the end of the presentation, I will be selecting the questions that are most relevant to the theme and the topic today. Um, if we haven't had a chance to answer your question, we'll get back to you personally um, from next week and ensure that we do answer your, your um, inquiries. So please, put any of your questions up there. You can also, I'll be putting up the links to our LinkedIn's. You can connect with us on LinkedIn at any time um, and we'll endeavor to make sure that we've um, answered any of the, uh, answered your curiosity. And that's what, what we want from these sessions. Um, this is a mini course that we've put together to provide you with thematic insights to our NLP Essentials course that is going to be delivered online in June. Um, in the corner of the slides is a little QR code, and we'll be sharing that towards the end of the slide deck as well. So if you're interested in joining the course, scan the QR code and join us. It'll be fantastic to see you again in June. Um, and we're really excited about the new course. We may go over the hour and we really actually enjoy the discussion part of the um, of the webinar. So we absolutely understand if you need to go on the hour. Um, it will be recorded so you can review the recording afterwards. You're absolutely welcome to stay um, and continue the discussions with us. So um, just to give you a heads up in case you've got another um, seminar or a coaching session, please feel free to go whenever you need to go. That's absolutely fine. So a little bit about Purposeful Innovators. Purposeful Innovators is a non-profit social enterprise registered in the UK. We're a membership of professionals across all fields that have dedicated their work to human and social development, the environment and sustainable finance. We're governed by a voluntary global board of seven directors, and we have over 80 plus pioneer members who have um, who are working towards the common mission, which is to revolutionize how the world works. Our motto is no compromise to planet, to people, and to profit. Our work falls within the five channels or pillars of education, social community projects, ESG consultancy, research, and environmental strategic partnerships. My name's Rania Lang. I'm founder of Purposeful Innovators. I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, a PCC ICF coach, and I also sit on the board of um, Global Board of Directors for the ICF Foundation. About the Institute, um, the Institute of the International Institute of Research and Human Development. Um, is accredited for adult education by the Ministry of Education in Luxembourg and accredited for IAS for ISO 9001-2015.
and is accredited by the Inter International Coaching Federation um, for levels one, uh, two and three. It specializes in certifying continuing professional training in coaching, NLP, leadership, management, and the Enneagram. We're joined here today by George. George is co-hosting with me and moderating today. He is a lecturer at the University of Durham. He's an ICFMCC coach, uh, SICPNL certified, a trainer and master practitioner of NLP. He's a spiral dynamics, sociocracy, and Enneagram specialist, and the Secretary General of the IAFM and former Secretary General of the ICF Luxembourg. He's a global ICF global member and past member of the Board of Directors for ECA EMCC Belgium. We are joined by our team today. Um, Oh, I didn't mention George is the founder of the Institute, uh, International Institute of Research and Human Development. And we are joined by our team, Mario, Wendy, Olivier, Costas, Natalia and Tracy today. And about our speaker, we've been really, really excited to have Dr. Costas um, on our online seminar, hosting our seminar with us today. Um, Dr. Costas is a neurologist at the National Organization of Health, Provision and Private, pra and Private Practitioner in Greece. He's the founding member and principal scientific advisor of the Interdisciplinary Associations for Applied Neuroscience on Cognitive and Behavioral Disorders in Elderly People. And he was a consultant in the Service Delivery and Safety Department at the World Health Organization, HQ in Geneva. Dr. Costas is a scientific lead and special advisor at the Health and Applied Neuroscience Network, a non-profit association. He's a training educator and volunteers for Action for Autism Organization and the National Service of Car Accident Victims. And he is presenting Human Aspects and Coaching, Seminar 3, The Neuroscience of Conflict Resolution. Over to you, Dr. Costas. Good morning to everyone and thank you so much Sonia, for this introduction and thank you all for this invitation today. Um, I'm very excited as well and uh, I thank you all for this invitation for someone that um, belongs to the medical world and has to explain some aspects um, uh, on coaching that are very, very, very important. Um, so we, we, I, I'm going to try to analyze a bit um, what anxiety and stress is, because it's very important to introduce these terms in a very probably um, wide way, but in the meantime, in very specialized way regarding um, medicine and um, the medical world and uh, then to focus on the workplace as well, and then to explain how emotional intelligence and what is, at first, emotional intelligence and how we can um, use or develop the emotional intelligence of every one of the collective to the workplace to give solutions regarding conflicts. So um, let's say that it's boring sometimes to try to analyze terms. Anxiety, what is anxiety, what is stress, what is the difference between anxiety and stress. Maybe you can find on the internet everything, or many people tried already to, to explain to you. But you see, today I'm going to give you first maybe another aspect of what anxiety and stress are based on our everyday life because i'm very happy that we started like saying as rania said i'm very excited that we are here and we talk i said i'm very excited that i'm here and we talk about that but i don't believe that many employees or employers today they woke up and they said the same thing I don't believe that there are many people that they woke up this morning and they said, I am excited, I'm going to work. And the, there begins the problem of what anxiety and stress are. 
Because if I tell you anxiety involves, as we say here, involves feelings, so that means feelings, so we talk about the feeling of fear, worry, and um, um, let's say worry and or dread in anticipation of a possible danger or something that um, is, uh, is uh, let's say, some, some, something negative that may come, this is abstract and anxiety is a bit a feeling for abstract things. And stress refers to a physical or psychological response, a tension we do have due to some demands, due to a trigger, due to something. Okay. But let's start from the beginning. So we, go, we, we wake up this morning and we have to go to work. But we wake up and we are not very okay because we have to go and work. So we are why we are not so so well. We are a bit negative. We go and do coffee and we do have in our minds, okay, today I have to go there, there, there this to do, this to organize, that what I forgot yesterday to do. And so first of all, we wake up and we we think job. That means job is always on our mind because job is the main thing for us, is for, for living and uh, uh, is so difficult to find today that if we get it, we have to keep it. So this is priority for us. So uh, what about if, for example, yesterday my director was a bit upset in general, they are so upset that they, I don't know, maybe tomorrow or maybe this weekend I try to cover a bit what I missed. And then you turn on the TV because you do coffee because, before to go to job. Ukraine war, killings, strikes. So, you know, we wake up morning time and we have plenty of very negative things but not necessarily for, let's say, for one, for, 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 a, for a particular demand. We are, we have fear, we are, we, are, we are not comfortable. And this, or maybe we can, we can think, uh, what about my kid that next week has to have an exam? And uh, in general, he doesn't like very much school. And in general, school is not very comfortable for my, my, my kids. And in general, I'm living in a city that doesn't give many, many, many incentives for, for, for my kids and stuff, whatever. I am anxious. I'm not well. I'm getting my coffee, but sometimes I need a very good coffee. Why? Because I need pleasure in my life. So I have so many negative thoughts and I'm in anxiety without knowing exactly why. But in the meantime, I'm stressed as well because I need to be on time in my work because today at nine o'clock we have a meeting and last time there was traffic jam and uh, 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 I, uh, I was over my job at nine and five and my director was pissed off. Sorry about the expression, but it's like that. So I am stressed. That means I have some fears. I have some issues for a particular demand, for a particular scope, for a particular thing, for a particular situation. Example, my director is a bit nervous with me because um, unfortunately I couldn't finish uh, a 14 hours job yesterday because I was so tired. It was impossible. So I said, I'm going home to finish the whole thing. I went at home and then uh, I had some other issues with my kids. I couldn't find the time to finish them. I'm going to the meeting this morning and uh, I'm not prepared. So this is an example that can give me anxiety and stress. This is an example that gives me what happens today to many, if, if not, to the majority of employees and employers as well, but because, because employers as well, they have someone above to respect. So what happens on that? Happens that our brain is not comfortable with the situation. My brain 
feels irritability, as we can see here. Anger, of course, is tired. I didn't sleep well. We have to say that sleep is the absolute way of um, um, of a tired brain, the absolute solution. We don't sleep well, our brain is not functioning well. Muscle pain, I'm going to explain that after why. I have problem with my stomach. And at the end, I say difficulty sleeping because sometimes we cannot sleep. We cannot stop sleeping. If we stop sleeping, we do have other issues then because our sleep is not exactly the normal one. So in that case, our brain is in a very negative mood, field, whatever. And you can understand that if me is like that, and I have to get out of my house to go to a work, to a workplace that I have then to collaborate with other 10 persons, plus my director, plus another collaborator. And if I have to affront 10, 12, maybe 15 different negative fields, as I described before, this is very difficult for a good collaboration. This is very difficult in the workplace. So we, we try to see, for example, that we, we, we try to, to, we have to understand that we cannot collaborate in a team with different negative brains, as I described. That can bring to problems. Then that can bring to issues. Because if I feel if I'm anxious in general, that means I'm not calm. I have, the, let's say, the majority of, of, of people, they have one main issue as the beginning. They cannot pay attention clearly and as it is demanded. We have deficit attention. And we have other issues that can make me not focusing well to my job. And this has to do with the anatomy of the brain. This has to do with some particularities of the brain. In this image, for example, you can see that we call prefrontal cortex and what we call prefrontal and anterior ciliate cortex is not just exactly the anatomy of, um, of uh, the frontal cortex that is connected with the emotional part, but all these, the blue, the red, and the small amygdala, yellow part you can see in our brain, is connected to the whole body. It's, they are connected with the whole brain, and they have connections with the whole body. So you can understand that if we have psychosomatic issues, as we call them, if I have stomachache, if I cannot sleep well, if I have muscle pain, if I have already some body issues and I am already in negative situation, as I described before, try to understand, we get this man or woman, we put him or her in a workplace and we put him or her collaborating with other 10 persons with the same issues, but not exactly the same as we have different faces, but we have two eyes, a mouth, a nose, but we have different faces. It's exactly the same issue here. We have different negativities, different anxieties, and sometimes they cannot mismatch together. It's impossible. So we have a mismatch. So we go to, we, we, we go to the workplace, and it's impossible to communicate. How can I communicate with someone who has mainly the same issues in a different way? So, um, for the moment, I leave a bit this kind of differentiation between anxiety and stress, because we have to analyze a bit what it happens to a workplace and what has to do with the fear, because fear 
is an emotion, a feeling that has to do with a particular thing, gives me stress, that means that prepares my body to fight. But we have to say that unfortunately, we live in a society of people with fear in the workplace. Their fear of example of being of, of being involved in a, in a negative situation in work, of losing their, their jobs, of losing their um, trust. And uh, someone gets in his workplace just in mind, having in mind that maybe today I'm going to have a problem with him or my uh, director or with my general manager. And already we are charged negatively. So we go to the workplace and with a fear in our eyes, we try to work. And the fear comes already from some contracts. I signed a contract because I need this job, but in the contract is written and is very well underlined that if I do the minimum of thought, I'm out. So do we believe that this is a social problem? Of course it is. Do we believe that this is a personal issue? Yes, but not necessarily very personal. And now I'm going to tell you what happens in a medical office when a neurologist is going to examine patients. Clear. Every day I see 10, from 8 to 13 patients. Let's say 10. I can give you 100% of all elements you need to prove that 60% of these people, they are there for problems connected with the workplace. Why? A neurologist like me, we see people with stroke, with epilepsies, with multiple sclerosis, with dementias, but as well headaches, migraine, um, uh, vertigo, numbness, um, confusion. So you can understand that someone comes to a neurologist because he has numbness, he sends, or because, for example, he is a little bit confused, has vertigo sometimes, he, uh, he has headaches all the time. 60% mainly we can have a connection with issues in the workplace. And then that there begins the problem. Then begins, begins the, the why a neurologist today is presenting anxiety and stress, and why then we talk about cognitive, uh, sorry, uh, emotional intelligence. Because when I have 60% of these persons having problems with the workplace, and we need to do exams, and we need to go under a diagnostic procedure to say at the end, look, you had an issue, but it's mainly stress. When we know very well that one of the major cause of strokes, of um, uh, vertigo, of migraine is stress. So we believe that in a period that the whole health system is collapsing, and we know that, maybe we have to see things in another way. Maybe in the committee of the HR have to be people apart only the HR, not only HR people. Maybe the HR people, they have to have a, a let's say more different or maybe more medical education as well. Because it's impossible to believe that today a doctor has 10 patients per day and the 60% of them, that means probably 30 patients per week, are people that they have issues because they're working in a bank, in a company, uh, in a hospital, um, they have a private office, and this is bad. So, what is emotional intelligence? Why I'm introducing emotional intelligence here? I'm introducing emotional intelligence because what it is, let's say at first, what do we mean when we say emotional intelligence? So 
You know, intelligence as a word is a Latin word. Uh, it means um, I, uh, I, I, I can learn. So the way I acquire information and how fast I acquire information and how I can apply this information to develop myself or to develop the society, this is intelligence. When we say emotional intelligence, we have to use another verb as well, and this is to perceive, to interpret, to control, to evaluate what my emotions, others' emotions, so to effectively and constructively collaborate. So what I want to say at the end, can I control, can I learn, can I well perceive my emotions, others' emotions, and can change all that in a positive way. I'm anxious. I describe you someone that gets to his workplace and uh, he's anxious. He has already some, uh, some issues, so he's stressed for presenting, for example, today something in a meeting at nine o'clock and he's, uh, he has to be on time and stuff. Can he manage all this? Can he accept that he's living in a society of 2023? Plenty, plenty of uh, negative stimuli against his brain. Can he have a filter so to control and to feed to to let's say to to uh, to to become to try to put down the whole thing and to put out the main and the better of his emotions? as an output. Is he cap or she capable to evaluate what is happening to his colleague and to try to understand him and to just have a two minute coffee and resolve the problem? Do we have the possibility to have an HR with more facilities, with more skills, with more uh, mm, mm, rights? and more, let's say, uh, dominance on what is happening in the workplace and not be so bored by uh, the direction as sometimes we do have, and we have people in HR that cannot proceed as they want. Can we use this information so as to sensibilize the society that already anxiety and stress to the workplace can induce many people to a healthcare system that is already collapsing. So here we have a big issue. Um, I believe yes. I believe for the first time that the the coaching world, companies that they have to do with um, HR and uh, educational schools that they have to. To, uh, to educate people for, for HR or for techniques that of coaching techniques or coaching schools and neuroscience have to be married at the end. So to proceed in a way that we won't have so much mental and health issues that they become health issues and not just anxiety and stress so as to resolve all these conflicts between employees, employers, managers, secretaries, assistants, and stuff. Just one thing before to cover up the whole this chapter, if we can just go back again, sorry, Rania. Um, the, 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 yes. As an emotional intelligence, we can see a word here, motivation. Um, the word motivation is very a very big key to our society today. Just to say to you that the lack of, mot of motivation to proceed with the professional issues can bring someone to have Alzheimer's in the future. 
or who wants bibliography and references, I'm here, ready to help. Uh, lack of motivation due to anxiety or stress, due to lack of emotional intelligence in general, due to lack of, of let's say, will to help, uh, can bring really to enormous health issues more than we can imagine. Sorry, if we go now to the, to the last slide, please. So this is the brain, and there is a word emoting that is in red. So I can just give you, uh, I, I can just tell you why I, uh, we put this, this brain there. You, you, you just cut it in two pieces, the right and the left one, um, straight on the middle. You do that. I can tell you already, all the, the left part, half of it, is emotions. So you can understand that half of our brain, plus down right where cerebellum is, you can find it, uh, is emotions. You can understand emotions are very, very important for our brain for our motivation, for our calmness, for our way of seeing things. And um, if we don't do anything about all these issues in the workplace today, we talk about 10, 12 hours plus, plus transport. So uh, I believe that we don't have any future. So I believe this is the time to start thinking over and uh, talk a bit brain when we talk for a workplace. So um, I'm going to end here because I believe I'm going to get boring. Then. Sorry about that. I believe we have to talk to, to discuss a bit. Maybe we have questions. And uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to discuss with people and uh, to share. Thank you very much for your attention and your kind um, um, patience because uh, having always a neurologist talking is not really great, but okay. <laughs> I cannot hear you. George, can you unmute? Oh, okay, <laughs> this is anxiety or stress. Uh, thank you very much for all this information. I will take two minutes to explain the last uh, the last uh, uh, slide, which is a direct uh, application to the coaching, as you saw through Costa's uh, speech. Uh, he gave us a good limit between coaching and medical issues. Uh, this is to respect for the coaches for uh, according to our ethical practice. And the other thing is, if we take Axianti, we can take the core quadrant of uh, Daniel Hoffman. I gave you the sources uh, underneath. Uh, pitfall could be an anxious person. And as a coach, we can ask to find out which core quality possibly to the excess become a pitfall for somebody. And we could find, we ask that to the coach here, and we can, for example, I give a reference example, visionary, somebody who has vision can be anxious because he's afraid that the vision will not work because people, they will not follow him. There is man, plenty of reasons. And at the same time, we can ask him what is the opposite positive of anxious, anxious could be flexible, for example, but also the coaches have to give his own word adjective. And uh, what is the point here? Here is that the visionary has to uh, grow up flexibility as a core quality to avoid pitfall. Daniel Hoffman tells us also that the excess of flexibility can create confusion. And the person who, lie, <coughs> who has troubles to go towards flexibility is because he's afraid of confusion. This is a, a schema that we can use to ask questions from anxiety, also from other emotions, just to give and bring more awareness 
to our coaching. And uh, after this little uh, practical uh, uh, use of what uh, the knowledge of uh, neurology can, can be uh, useful for us, I give back uh, the, the time and the speech to Dr. Petsanis to answer to your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, George. Um, and we have, uh, please start posting your questions up. We've got the, our first question by uh, Sananda. Do stress and anxiety feed off each other? And can I be stressed but not anxious? Sorry, uh, can you repeat, please? Do stress and anxiety feed off each other? Can I be stressed but not anxious? Okay. Uh, first of all, I need to explain something. Uh, stress is something normal, something that my brain has to have because uh, I have to survive. And in a parallel way, I give another word, the word inflammation. Inflammation is something normal, physiological for my body that needs to be there so as to repair if I have a damage. The problem is not stress or inflammation. The problem is their intensity. Sometimes I have an inflammation. Sometimes I have fever, another physiological, classic physiological situation for my body, but in a pathologic intense. If I have fever 40 for three days, I'm over. If I have an inflammation that can give then negative perspectives for my living, for my surviving, I'm gonna be dead. Stress is there to alert me, but sometimes is exaggerated. And this is the pathological way of seeing stress. Uh, I have stress for an issue, yes, but in general, I'm not anxious, yes. I'm not someone in always in an alert because I have issues, abstract, and um, I don't know why, but in general, I don't like my, 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 my daily thing is with plenty of negative uh, inputs. Um, yes, but someone probably is calm. Someone has no issues, is okay, he can manage. He has an emotional intelligence of that level that he can manage, he can filter negativity from uh, everyday life. But he's stressed because tomorrow has a, a match. He is a basketball player and he has to perform. Example. Yes, of course. I'll, so we can we can divide the, the two the two issues here. I don't know if that was convincing. Yeah, Wendy, you're nodding your head. So uh, what? <laughs> Yes, uh, the intensity of, yeah, we can handle stress, we can handle anxiety, but handling too much for too long, it's like holding a glass of water. In itself, it's fine, but it turns into how long are you going to hold on to it because that becomes painful and could cause damage. So absolutely, totally support, Custis. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mario, have you got This is a good time? example as well. Uh, about organizations, it's, it's interesting to, um, we're talking about pressure. So what is the pressure that an organization can put on a person in a um, work environment? And my impression is that one of the causes of this can be the confusion between performance, that, that is a result, and um, the pressure on the, the employees uh, that can produce this in, intense and long time um, un, un, uncomfortable, unco uncomfortable situation that can drive to anxiety, stress and anxiety. So maybe 
um, this could be um, a way to think about what we mean when we say uh, performance, for example. Um, because if performance is to, to put a big pressure on, on employees to produce something, um, some product, um, maybe it's not the correct way to think. So if you want to help organizations, we can make them understand the difference between the good a good work process in a good work environment and what they mean when they say performance to avoid the behaviors that can put a big pressure on people and cause uh, stress or anxiety. So I'll, I'm a little bit step back. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. Just before, just before the situation of of stress, um, huge stress and anxiety. So we analyze the performance. What the performance? We analyze the, the we analyze the key the key performance indicator in a correct way, and should have the good behaviors to avoid the Look, um, the huge pressure the and stress. Yeah. When we talk about performance of an employee or an employer, um, first of all, we have to see what is in his contract. Yeah. Hello, I'm here. Yes, I'm a doctor. Okay, this is a medical office. So what I have to do? You have to see patients. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, you have to work from 8 o'clock in the morning up to 8 o'clock in the evening. Oh, why? Because we have to see 15 patients. So I know that this is not correct. But I need to be here and to work because otherwise I don't have a job. So I'm saying what? Okay, no problem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, even if it's risky. Example. Why United States, they claim that the third cause of death is medical error, because instead of doing seven, example, seven interventions, orthopedic interventions, they do 16, because that's a good doctor gets money to the company, that means the hospital, but he's tired. At the end, he's going to pay medical error. So who is the employee? who is the performer has to understand that we cannot accept the contract because otherwise we're going to lose the job. Or who is the employer has to understand that there's going to be someone that is going to proceed to a legal procedure if a contract is ridiculous, as of many that we've seen. As a neurologist, I asked to see a contract of a patient of mine that he works in a bank. I can tell you, I called the HR of the bank. The dialogue we, we did have, I had to register it. I didn't. Ah, that would be very, very, very interesting. I can tell you, we are... Uh, absolutely re responsible for what we sign. If I sign that I'm going to work 12 hours as a as a as a doctor, for example, as a as a uh, whatever, as an employee, I have to manage that because I know that I'm going to be absolutely tired, and I'm going to do faults, and I'm going to do errors, and uh, and then conflicts will happen. So, and if I am an employer. And I demand someone to stay 14 hours today because tomorrow we have to deliver a work. I have to understand that I have a human being there, not to give me fear that he's going to lose yeah. his work if he don't. Yeah. So, guys, we are in a society of thinking people. So yeah. if we don't use this at the end, this is our fault in general. Absolutely. Absolutely, Costas. Because what can I the... say as a doctor? Yeah. Because if the if the performance leverage is fear, so I make you frightened to make you work, it's a disaster. <laughs> it's just a disaster. So 
I think it's a very serious point to reflect on because for now, yeah. we, can, we can notice that uh, in many cases, fear is the performance leverage, pretend performance le leverage. I have the to add that, uh, uh, given the fact I know Costa since a few years, uh, I know he's not only a medicine, he's a philosopher also, uh, he fights for a lot of human rights. Uh, the thing is, uh, going around the world last year for some, uh, some uh, research, I think there is a philosophical approach also. We have two proposals. We have the proposal of the European and North American approach of uh, uh, utility. It's utility who master our society. And I found out uh, in other uh, uh, culture, civilization, if you like, uh, the proposal of uh, the communion of relation. It is very important to go back to our roots and uh, to see in another point of view, our relationship uh, within the world, our relationship uh, within the society, the social uh, relation. And I saw passing through about teenagers and anxiety from the university, I can assure you that new uh, teenagers, they don't have vision. A vision is a, a, a central thing of our life. What is the ontological is very fashionable now coaching just to give vision. A vision goes through a relationship, personal relationship. And we have to consider this kind of proposal in our life. Fantastic. I've got a really good question from Merle around the conflict situations in the workplace that I think would be really interesting to explore at the moment. So how can you elaborate the effects of anxiety, stress within a conflict situation when two people are anxious and stressed and run into the situation of conflict? What can a coach do to help this? I answer the first. Costas gave a lot of elements of, uh, of the, the roots of anxiety. I gave also the, uh, a schema, in fact, it's a, a potentiality of questions. It would be good as a coach, eh? I talk only as a coach, to ask questions, to bring awareness to the people. And one of the main points is to see the other part. What is the positive intention of the other part of doing something? one question. Second question would be, uh, what is the core quality of the other person to go in a stress situation or to a pitfall? Just stay human. This for my part, I give the, the uh, costas also to add things on that. Can you repeat, please? Sorry, because it was a cat. Can you repeat the question, please, Anya? Repeat the question. Uh, can you elaborate the effects of anxiety and stress in a conflict situation? When two people are anxious and stressed, run into a situation of a conflict. What can a coach do to help? So what's the coaching? The coach, us as ICF coaches, what are our roles to help a situation where two yeah. people are experiencing stress, stress and anxiety? Sorry, I, I, think, I think George answered, but I, I think, sorry, do, 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 do you, you would like an answer by me as well? Yeah, yeah uh, Pardon, as a you, do, you ask, do you hear my answer or not? Yes, it cuts yeah. a bit, but look, I can tell you what, you are not the expert here, but I believe the coach has to do the best, so as these people, they are not coming to my office with problems. You understand? Yes. Because yes. as soon as they come to my office, that means that the coaching system or didn't perceive well the problem or didn't perform well, or I don't know, not to accuse the system of coaches, but guys, if at the end they come to me, means that something here is missing. Or if you want, if I have the possibility to be maybe in a meeting with the coaches after the first meeting, coach and people, maybe to, to be there to discuss a bit. So we can um, we, we can avoid 
that these people they 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 call me for 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 rendezvous. I I, I think this is the case. Yeah, and I think that in coaching we can we can try to question also the core values of the person of the, of the people involved in the conflict, because of course the conflict is a conflict of values. Um, I'm expecting something and I don't have it, or I'm promising something and I don't give it. So um, everybody's deceived um, and and get stressed or anxious because what's going on is not what was what was um, in the project in the, in the um, first project. So maybe to come back to the core values. Uh, what are the needs, what we want to satisfy, and uh, try to understand the reasons of the conflict. As Georgia said, uh, the positive intention behind uh, um, each one behavior and what, what each one is, is expecting from the relationship um, to, to make it better, to make it, um, um, to make it develop. In a, in a positive way and find out a new solutions that can avoid the conflict. In some organizations, it's very difficult to do it because it's a very vertical um, hierarchy, but in, in, in many cases, it's possible to, to question and investigate the, the values behind the conflict and the, expect and the expectations behind the conflict and the needs behind the conflicts to harmonize and balance um, the relationship. So question values, needs, expectations, and maybe you, have, you, you will have some good indicators to make the relationship more balanced. I would like to add something which is uh, critical for me, especially for coaches. And I say very often when I certify coaches, we don't certify in ICF goals. We certify just coaches. We have to know our limits. And we have, I strongly suggest to coaches to have near them a neurologist and psychiatrist just to take uh, uh, um, advice for them and also to respect in the best way the ethical considerations of ICF that mean coaching is concerning present and future we go back to find out resources, but we don't go back to do medical operations. This is not our job. That means be careful what you are doing with people. I think we thank you very much, George. We're on the hour, so we understand um, if you need to leave, but we will be sharing the recordings at the end of the week. Thank you very much, Gwynell. Um, and it will be of all of the sessions that we've run this this week. If you can stay and carry on the chat, that would be absolutely fantastic. And we will get back to the, all the questions that have been shared with us. So uh, we'll just a question, uh, Costas, can you stay because I know you are in the hospital? Uh, I uh, am actually struggling. I'm sorry. Uh, Okay. Uh, okay. We have Thank to let him so go. Much. Yeah, we need to let but, him go. You've been absolutely fantastic. Uh, and he will be back I, I, in just a moment. He, he will be back with us Sunday man, uh, Saturday morning, in fact. Same time, same just place on thing, Saturday. Saturday morning, I'm all yours. I can stay up to afternoon. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would love to say that, um, okay, today it's a bit struggling, but uh, I, I, I'd love for maybe to to, to take over for, for the next time and to explain whatever and to proceed on that because I know it's very important. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was very, I'm, I'm very happy that I had the discussion today. I'm motivated and I'm excited and this is very good. Uh, Saturday, feel free. We have nine o'clock, but I can stay home. Whatever, no problem. Thank, thank, you, you, this. thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Costa. Thank you, thank you very much to our, thank you to our lovely coach thank you audiences. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, thank bye you bye. also to the team. Bye -bye, we'll continue bye to all of the you. discussion. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Um, and yes, yeah, so um, what next? Would you like a new question or would you like to continue on the same topic 
What I propose is that we go through with questions. If we can answer to them, it's okay. If it's a medical one, we can just uh, take it back in uh, Saturday morning. Uh, we can Perfect. Go. I can see Aisha's um, in, still here with us. I'm going to put forward her question. Is how can we help and support Gen Zs? So new generations that are only 100% digitally native. They are the only 100% digitally native generation. Growing up with social media, they seem to have challenges managing stress and anxiety, perhaps a lack of resilience skills. What I can answer to that is from my experience with teenagers at the university. What I said, I come back to that. Uh, it's a lack of vision. I realize a lot of, of uh, my students go back to find out what is the code of value of our parents, in my generation, parents, in fact, in the grandparents, and this is an, a, a, a significant alarm for our society. Now it's good for coaches to work out uh, how we are going to place the ontological uh, coaching. I use this term if, even if I'm not very okay with. Uh, the thing is to work on the sense of the life of new people. Uh, in NLP and uh, Wendy and Mario, the specialists on that, uh, we have the logical levels just to start from the what is the mission, the vision, the sense of the life to go to the role of these people, of the young people in this society, and uh, uh, explore afterwards uh, the values, the, the 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 beliefs, and above all the uh, competencies. Competences is very important. People, they don't have feedback, as we said yesterday. They don't believe of themselves. We have just to accentuate positive feedback and to accentuate the self-esteem and the self-confidence. This is for my part. I think we have to keep also the question for Saturday. And I give the I give to Mario and to Wendy to add things or to Natalia. Yeah, maybe can add, add something because I work in, um, in the sport universe and I used to work with young people, um, a lot of young people. Um, even in sport, I'm a special rugby, so uh, it's a collective uh, game. And it's interesting that even in rugby, a collective game, you can find this, this problem of the Z gen. Um, because they so um, linked to the bond to the to the habit of the um, social networks, for example, <laughs> and the paradox is that in some cases that the, the everybody's on the field, I mean beside the field, and they send each other messages instead of talk <laughs> directly with the person. That is uh, twenty-five meters. Uh, on the right or on the left. Uh, so it's interesting to see if the habit um, is dominating the behavior. And it's not so easy to change habits, but we can, as Jojo said, um, questioning the, the, the behaviors, the capabilities, um, and then the core values. And it's impressive to see that it's very easy to change when the person has um, a goal. So we come back to the, to the Wendy's um, presentation of Monday, uh, the goal setting. I think that the goal setting is very important for this generation because they believe they have no goals. Um, and of course they have and they can have. Um, so the goal setting is very important in my experience. The goal setting is very important because it, it allows that allows everybody to open the, a good question about the values behind the goal and the effects of the, the re realization of the goal, the achievement of the goal. So I think that um, the goal setting is maybe the first and fundamental step to open a new um, a, a new system of proposals for the young generation. And then if Wendy is mm. okay with that. I totally agree. Um, having clear goals, but it, I think it comes, a lot of it comes down to their identity, their sense of self. 
Um, I think for the younger generation, especially in this digital world, that there's a very strong emphasis on that external frame of reference. Do people like me? Do they, they, they need that external feedback from other people? And they're, they're lacking in building that internal, um, the ability to, to check for themselves. Are they doing well? You know, where's their levels of self-esteem? So I do feel that it all starts with diet. You know, what we consume is not just food. It's what we watch. It's what we listen to. It's what we follow. It's what we hear. It's, it's absolutely everything. So I think to, to help the younger generations, introduce them to your menu is a blank sheet of paper and help people make good choices as to what they're going to put their focus on. What goals would they like to set? Um, because they really do have a blank canvas, uh, but it's just they're not seeing any space at the moment because it's just everything is being allowed to get into them so they need to set up some strong filters yeah. that's that's my perspective anyway yeah. hello <laughs> i was muted then i was talking but nothing was coming out um so the other people that did put forward their questions um have left um for uh have left the room now so i will uh if everyone's got a few more minutes if anyone here has got a question that they'd like to put on their um mic and their uh video and put it to the team we can take one more yeah i've seen a few comments and questions based focusing around the clarifying the difference between stress and anxiety um i think the the important thing to that as coaches that we need to be aware of, our role is not to have answers and not to have clear definitions. It's to help the client unpack what does that mean to them? What does it look like? You know, how, how has it come about? So we're helping them to unpack it. I'd say for when it comes to anxiety, and going back to Dr. Costa's definition, um, anxiety is feelings, fear, or worry. It's anticipation of possible danger or a negative outcome. So anxiety is your, it's a negative emotion. It's a negative response to something that hasn't even happened yet. It's an anticipation. So it's not something that's happening right now, but it's that future anticipation. Something is going to happen. You're already worried about it. So guess what? Because you're worrying you're focusing on it going badly. So how to unpack that and get much clearer on, focus on what you want. What does that look like, feel like, sound like, when it go, what does success look like? So to help unpack that um, anxiety, for me, it's really, okay, so how would you rather it went instead? What would be the best outcome for you? So I just feel that's a, an important one to highlight. Thank you, Wendy. I would like to add again what I said before. The coach approach is to ask questions. This is one thing. The second thing is from anxiety, we have to find the trigger. It could be fear. It could be, I don't know, other, other um, options as we show on the, on the slide also. Ask questions to find out what the your coach trigger it's not you to say what it's anxiety it's not you to decide for them be careful about them because sometimes we project our beliefs to the customers and also where they they can say what is the core uh, quality that can con uh, conduct them to anxiety be careful when you use the schema that i saw before you have to focus on your customer world he has to say what is anxiety what is the core quality what is his challenge in a specific very specific event because if we change context we change approach we change meaning for your customers and this is the most uh, delicate if i can say a part of the coaching 
don't uh, it's good to know what is the one what is the other you have the knowledge of the uh, neurology the neurologic approach but our job is to ask questions and to bring self-awareness in 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 order to allow coachee to establish a how do you say that a, a, a strategy of self uh, self-regulation of their emotions yeah Definitely. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to our audience today. And thank you very much to our team. I think, um, I think the George, you um, summarized that the, really why we are passionate about the NLP course with regards to that. It really gives you the understanding of a little bit of the neuroscience enough to be able to help our coaches, um, but it doesn't actually replace that whole, we're not doctors, we're not, we're not Dr. Costa. You know, it's just um, being able to appreciate the scientific approach of how the brain works. Um, and that really does help with coaching, but it's making sure that we understand what our role is, what our ethical role is as, as coaches as well as the most important thing. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, and we are, have got tomorrow, it's Wendy hosting um, <laughs> How to Manage Strong Emotions. So we're going to continue our journey with you tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing you then. Have a fantastic ICW. And yes, yeah, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.